Operator Day North America 2021. In the six months since KubeCon Europe, Kubernetes usage has continued to spread. From the enterprise, to machine learning, to micro clouds on the edge, use cases are being defined and supported by an ever-growing host of technologies, many of which are open source. Six months ago, we conducted our first Kubernetes and cloud native operations survey and report. We found that 30% of the 1,100 respondents said that trying out operators and charmed operators is on their to-do list. Why such popularity? Today, we'll explore operator usage in more detail. First, by showing a broad overview of what you can accomplish with them, then by digging into areas of interest where charmed operators are gaining ground. Observability, AIML, DevSecOps, data ops, networking, finance, telco, the edge, across the enterprise and at your own workstation. We'll explore the use cases and success stories of organizations adopting Kubernetes and provide an update on the Charmed Operator framework. And then we have something exciting in store. We'll finish the day by learning about the future of Kubernetes and its ecosystem by questioning a panel of thought leaders, including Mark Shuttleworth, the CEO of Canonical, Tim Hawken, a principal engineer at Google, who's working on Kubernetes, GCE, and Google Cloud, Michael Hausenblaus, a solution engineering lead in observability at AWS, Ken Seip, the department leader in application and technology architecture at Edward Jones, um, Karthi Kayan Shanmugam, the developer, a digital solution architect at HCL, and Alexis Richardson, the CEO of Weaveworks. And now to get the day started, let me introduce Mark Shuttleworth. David, good morning. How are you? I'm excellent. Mark, where are you calling in from today? I am, uh, I am in West Africa. Uh, technically, I'm on a small island about 200 kilometers off the coast of West Africa. So there's a large number of miracles involved in, in this conversation this morning. So far, so good. Um, hopefully, the chickens will be quiet, the pigs will be quiet, and the bandwidth will be good. Excellent. So speaking about uh, cattle versus pets. Um, <laughs> um, Mark, everywhere I turn, I'm hearing people talking about micro cloud or multi cloud, uh, micro cloud also, but nearly 78% of respondents to our survey said that they were running a hybrid cloud or a or multi clouds in production. What's happening here? Um, I think you're seeing the impact of the deep investment by the different public clouds in differentiated capabilities. You know, uh, it's easy to think of the clouds as commodity compute. But in fact, Google is building things that are kind of uniquely Google. Microsoft's building things that are uniquely Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle, IBM. And so as a buyer, I, I think there are genuine reasons to want to tap specialist capabilities and unique kind of capabilities in each of those clouds. So that's one reason why buyers end up um, contracting with multiple clouds and having to figure out multi-cloud. Um, another reason is competition. Um, and then I think you have the laws of physics. Um, the edge is cloudy, right? Small clusters at the edge of Kubernetes are cloudy. You want to think of that as a cloud. But the public clouds, it's quite difficult for the public clouds to sort of offer that in the same kind of way that they offer centralized data center compute. Um, so physics, economics, and essentially innovation are all kind of driving that multi-cloud push. Gardner was projecting that by 2023, Kubernetes would be deployed in more than 80% of all on-premise private clouds and cloud-inspired environments. Does that sound accurate? What yeah, does I think it look like to get there? I think, um, I think on, on, on what you would call clouds effectively, that's, that there's a pretty straightforward path to achieve that, which is integration of Kubernetes by the cloud infrastructure providers. I mean, on, on Amazon now, you can go push the EKS button and you get a Kubernetes. Google has GKE, Amazon has AKS. Um, uh, if, you, if you look across the range of private and public cloud options, um, a built-in Kubernetes is a pretty guaranteed offering. Um, and most people should really be using that. The built-in Kubernetes is almost certainly the best thing for you on whatever infrastructure you've chosen. Um, Self-managed self Kubernetes is hard. 
There are times when you'd have to do that, like Edge or MicroCloud. Um, but even then, maybe you could consider a, a managed Kubernetes, which mitigates somewhat the, the skills gap. Speaking about the skills gap, um, about 55% of organizations reported a lack of in-house skills or limited manpower. Um, given the tendencies towards multi-cloud adoption and Kate's on private clouds, where does Ubuntu fit into this cloud native world? So I think there are, there are a couple of different things and, and um, they are somewhat indirect, right? So if you, if you think about the path that people are on, um, we're going through a bit of a trough of disillusion with Kubernetes, mainly because we're going through a handover of Kubernetes from the first wave of sort of superstars who took it into production to prove that this was a better way into you know, general maintenance and the general um, sort of technology community where people have other priorities, right? They, they, they don't want to do science projects. Um, you hear, you know, it's becoming cool to be a bit skeptical of Kubernetes. It's becoming cool to be skeptical of microservices. Some people will say they're more productive in a monolith. Uh, um, but that's just the normal kind of transition from science to, to, to standard, right? Um, most people, again, shouldn't be building a Kubernetes, they should just use the built-in one, right? So if you think about what Kubernetes does for you on a public cloud, it's, it's essentially aggregating all the different capabilities of compute network and storage, you know, and, and on the Google cloud, Google is gonna have the best idea about how to present uh, dashboarding, monitoring, disks, et cetera, et cetera, identity and so on and so forth. So, you know, again, use the, Kubernetes that comes built into the infra because it will express the infra in the cleanest, nicest sort of way. So then what's the role for Canonical? What's the role for, um, for Ubuntu? Um, actually, I think there are two really important places where you do care about, about um, the platform as it were. One is the, the, the host of the, of the containers, right? That, that essentially decides all of the security primitive primitives that are available to that particular Kubernetes. Um, and Ubuntu is quite famous for generally having cleaner, leaner, newer capabilities with newer and better security primitives and performance primitives to really specify and control what's happening in those containers. That's why most of the most of the superstars picked Ubuntu for, for their container adventures, right? They, they generally wanted access to that newer, shiner, shinier, better kernel than you're going to get with a, with a traditional enterprise Linux where the kernel might be two, three, four, five years out of date. Um, we partner with Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and the other infrastructure providers to super optimize the Ubuntu kernel in each of those places and make sure that there is an Ubuntu host option for the built-in Kubernetes in each of those places effectively. And you really want to choose that option because it's going to give you the best mix of portability and performance, capability, integration, security. The other place where um, it really matters uh, what you enable and what you support uh, from an operating system point of view is in your developer experience. And if you think about what's going into the container, um, if you give developers free choice, 80% of them will choose Ubuntu. So that developer experience story is a big part of the benefit of Kubernetes. So you may as well give developers the experience that they want, which, which is Ubuntu, right? So you can say canonical Ubuntu, we're not so much focused on the Kubernetes, right? On Google, that should come from Google. But we're focused on the environment around the Kubernetes, the kernel underneath it, the operating system underneath it, and the, and the operating system experience for the developers of the containers that, you, that, you're, um, that you're shipping onto it effectively. Now, in the cases where the infra can't do the work for you, we do obviously then provide a Kubernetes, but I would say that um, that's got to be, it's got to be kind of in your, in your, in your decision tree, it's got to be like, okay, we, we don't have an infra, infra provided Ubuntu option here, so therefore we have, to, we have to run our own. There we offer two, both of them are focused on operations costs, right? The one end of the spectrum, microcates is zero ops, you know what I mean? It has no knobs, so there's no ops. You literally install it and cluster it with one command and you're done. You've got no knobs, no dials, no options, no configuration. Right? It's really, really like on rails. Mm -hmm. um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have Charmed Kubernetes that's also focused on operations, but allows a lot more latitude for the knobs and the dials and the integration and permutations and combinations of different kinds of storage or so on. 
again, you should really only be into that if, if you have very specific reasons to want access to those integration capabilities. Um, in both cases, you will do better with microgates or charm Kubernetes than I think any other distribution of Kubernetes from an operations point of view. So Ubuntu is really throughout the space here. Um, and there's a lot of room in the Kubernetes environment um, to, to make a choice and choose the, the operating system that uh, it sounds like 80% of people are, are interested in, in already choosing. You mentioned that microcates. Our last survey showed that, um, almost, uh, that just over 25% of people are running microcates during local, local container development. Um, microcates takes you further than just your own machine. Yeah, so we started with microcates really focused on the developer experience and wanting to give developers a single node Kubernetes just for their laptop. Um, and, and what we then found was people saying, but I want to take this to production. Like, I really love the experience of microcates on my laptop. Can I take it to production? And for production, you need to be able to cluster. You need to be able to scale. So we, um, we, we added clustering um, to microcates and we try to preserve the zero ops mentality, right? So we, we added just literally one operation, which was clustering. So you've got one operation to install, and one operation to cluster, and that's it. Everything else is, is on Rails. Uh, we've scale tested that to up to 150 nodes. Microcates does automatically does all of the high availability, all of the essentially decisioning as to what becomes a control plane element, what becomes a database element, all of that's handled automatically. So there are zero ops, right? We've, we've also tried to stay true to the idea of minimizing the footprint so that you get ma the, the maximum amount of your cores, RAM, compute capacity focused on the workload and, and less obviously on the, on the control plane of the Kubernetes. We've scale tested that up now to 150 nodes. You've got this kind of just works no brainer option, right, for, for building clusters now. Um, Again, I, I would still push the easy button on, on, on the public cloud if, you, if you're on a public cloud. But if you have to get off the public cloud, if you're in some environment where you don't have an easy button, microcates is almost certainly the easy button in that environment, right? The main use case for that would be edge, where people are building small clusters at the back of a you know, factory or, or warehouse or you know, drilling rig or some other sort of distributed environment. A couple of nodes, microcates on those, and you've got a no-brainer uh, kind of... Um, Kubernetes. The other group that really love it is ISVs because it's a it's a no-brainer kind of Kubernetes that they can then provide their applications on top of. So ISVs who've, who've leapt onto Kates now have a problem where you know everybody's Kates is different. So if they use micro Kates, then they can get a nice standardized Kates environment um, with where they don't have to produce a lot of documentation as to how to run the Kates to run their applications effectively. That makes a lot of sense. Um, thanks for digging into that. Let's. Let's move on and talk a little bit about security. Uh, in a, in a multi-cloud world, what should we consider when we're thinking about security of our state? Um, what role does Canonical play there? Um, so a critical thing obviously is the underlying uh, sort of security maintenance commitment. And we see regularly now when people do a broad-based analysis of the enterprise Linux platforms uh, and the key, key access really is Ubuntu versus Red Hat. Ubuntu comes up top. Um, on all the critical metrics, how many packages we actually cover, the response time on those packages, the number of fixes by which you mean basically the, the level of criticality. So some vendors will only fix you know, your critical fixes, your, your critical issues. We will go down to medium, sometimes even low um, risk fixes and ship those fixes. And then last is a defect rate, right? Every time you're changing software, there's a risk that the change you make has adverse consequences other than just fixing the security issue that you have. Um, so uh, um, Ubuntu is consistently ranking number one now across that, uh, you know, that kind of security posture. Um, so that makes it an important ingredient. Um, we're also looking to offer um, long-term security commitments to some standardized Docker images of famous applications, right? So you can get an off the shelf Docker image of Kafka, which has a 10-year security commitment to it, for example. That's very useful to enterprises in their Kubernetes strategy in a multi-cloud sort of way. Um, when it comes to the Kubernetes itself, obviously, microcase, charm Kubernetes, which are our distributions of Kubernetes, those get long-term security commitments and a, and, a, and a high SLA. But again, mainly it's about how we work with the infrastructure providers 
to essentially facilitate the rollout of, of you know, a, a fixed version of GKE, a fixed version of AKS um, on the shortest possible timeline um, uh, with very high quality effectively in those environments. What's coming up next here? Um, what, what else is Canonical doing in this space? What's on your radar? Well, we've talked a lot about the Kates layer, and I think the Kates layer really is getting standardized. It's turning into a push button thing as the infrastructure providers integrate it and enable that experience. And the next hard problem is, is the applications on top of that, right? Everyday operations, which you, of the stuff that's not the infrastructure. Um, so we see a lot of uh, talk about GitOps, right? The idea that you can keep everything in source code and then you make changes in source code and kind of those changes ripple out through various layers out to, to production. And I think that makes sense for the code that is unique to your business, right? Like that code, no one else can help with that code. Um, but there's huge amounts of application stuff, which is effectively a commodity. It's standard stuff that everybody's running, right? And it doesn't make sense um, to put that level of investment repeatedly across different businesses into things that everybody's got to do. Um, you know, we, rolling your own doesn't make sense when your own such and such is something that in fact is a commodity, right? So that's where we're focused. Um, I talked about LTS Docker images, making Docker images of a long list of things that everybody's running so that they don't have to kind of do the baseline security maintenance of those things. They can just essentially integrate into a pipeline, the, the latest secure Docker image. And then we make the same commitment to, to security fixes that don't break other things in those Docker images that we've historically made to devs in, in, in the distro. Um, uh, it fits essentially with, with what we already do for customers. We're just extending that into the Kubernetes space. Um, in addition to security maintenance, you also got to think about the skills gap around the operations of those applications. Every application has a whole long list of things that you've got to do operationally. And you kind of need to know specialist things about that. But again, that's a standard commodity thing. That's something that everybody's doing, that's standard application. So I think the, the next level of challenge really is to standardize the operations for cloud native work, workloads. So that's a big focus for us. That, um, the, 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 the operator pattern is effectively being able to encapsulate operations in code. And what we want to do is standardize that so that it becomes almost universal how you would deal with lots of different applications from lots of different open source upstreams effectively, right? So that you don't have to, you don't have to develop your own set of procedures and processes for, for every different application. So we call that high level abstraction model driven operations. Um, and this is sort of the standardization of day two. Um, it's a level above the op operator pattern. Uh, it, it, we essentially take those operators, we call them charmed operators. The charms effectively take the model and apply that to the, to the actual code that's running. Um, and, and they allow for, for very widespread reuse of that operational code effectively across lots of different scenarios and lots of different businesses. So the next wave, so it looks like this, you've got a push button Kubernetes, you have that everywhere, right? You have it at the edge, uh, if it, with, with microcates or charm Kubernetes, you have it on all of your clouds integrated with the clouds, you have it on VMware integrated by VMware. Um, on bare metal, I would use charm or, or microcates. Um, you then have a push button standard way to operate a bunch of standard applications on top of that in a multi-cloud way, right? You can operate the same applications the same way anywhere effectively, um, thanks to Kubernetes, thanks to charmed operators. Um, and, and then you've got your own stuff, right? Your own stuff, which you can either charm and bring into that model, or you can use some sort of GitOps pattern with where you know, the level of investment is, 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 makes sense in the context of what you're doing. Mark, this is a, a great intro for the day. Um, we're about to bring on our, our next speaker here who's going to go into model-driven operations and um, the, the, the Juju charmed operator Lifecycle Manager. We're, we've got a, a big day of programming ahead. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, and while we're getting ready with, uh, with, with Ryan Berry, I've just got a, a few more things to say about uh, the, the survey that's in progress. So Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again later in the day. Thank you for the invitation. I hope everybody um, has a great day.